Christian education has to do with the formation of Christian persons, individuals who think Christianly and who live Christianly. At the heart of this educational process, we find the integration of faith and learning, a practice which many have identified as the distinctive task of the Christian school. What then is faith integration? It is when every subject is taught from a biblical worldview. It is when the entire educational program promotes spiritual development, ethical integrity, church affiliation, and involvement in witness and service. The overarching goal is that faith and learning must fuse within the context of a Christian life. This takes us to a formal definition of faith integration developed by the Institute of Christian Teaching under the leadership of Umberto Rossi. The integration of faith and values with teaching and learning is a deliberate and systematic process of approaching the entire educational enterprise, both curricular and co-curricular, from a biblical perspective. In a Seventh-day Adventist setting, its aim is to ensure that by the time students complete their studies, they will have freely internalized beliefs and values and a view of knowledge, life, and destiny that is Bible-based, Christ-centered, service-oriented, and kingdom directed. Succinctly, and in a similar vein, Ellen White wrote, The students in our schools and all our youth should be given an education that will strengthen them in the faith. Perhaps influenced by the ancient Greeks, the Gnostics, we tend to fall into dualistic thinking. We create false dichotomies, such as love versus authority, mercy or justice, theory versus practice, student or subject, and perhaps the greatest false dichotomy of all, faith versus learning. Faith integration, however, is biblical. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10.31, Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Two key elements. Whatever you do. Whether such common activities as eating or drinking, preparing our lessons, teaching our classes, conducting assessments, interacting with our students. All is to be done to the glory of God. And what is God's glory? Exodus 34 affirms that God's glory is his character, his attributes, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. To do all to God's glory, then, is to present an accurate and attractive picture of who God truly is, so that our students will say, If God is like my teacher, I want to know God. Paul also states in Colossians 3.17, Whatever you do, in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Again, whatever you do. And as educators, we are persons of words and of deeds. Whatever we do, we are to do it in the name of the Lord Jesus as his official representative. How we teach our classes is as he 
would teach them. How we relate to our students is as he would relate. And we do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. That is, we recognize that Jesus is Lord. This is his classroom. This is his school. I am just his ambassador. There is one more foundational passage. In 2 Corinthians 10.5, Paul affirms that we are to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. What does that phrase mean? Every thought captive. The educational program is made up of courses. Courses are made up of topics, topics of concepts, and concepts of thoughts. If every thought is in submission to Christ, that means that every concept, every topic, every course, and indeed the entire educational program recognizes that Jesus is Lord. Ellen White writes in the Youth Instructor, May 30, 1895, Bible religion is not to be like a dash of color brushed here and there upon the canvas, but its influence is to pervade the whole life. As though the canvas were dipped into the color until every thread of the fabric was dyed a deep, fast, unfading hue. The concept that faith, learning, and life are linked is also biblical. Romans 10.17 declares, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Faith, then, is connected to hearing, to learning about God and about His plan for our life. But James 2.17 adds, Faith without works is dead. Faith, then, must link to life. It must make a difference in the decisions that we make, in the attitudes that we develop in the life that we live. And undergirding all of this is the Word of God, the biblical worldview. What then is the unity of faith, learning, and life? It is when Christian beliefs and values provide the bedrock for the academic endeavor, which seeks in turn to relate Christianity to the full range of human existence and culture. This is more than just a mixture, a chance encounter. It is when the biblical worldview is the foundation of all learning and life. Sometimes we endeavor to approach faith integration in different ways, some of which are more effective than others. The first circumstance is when there is total separation. Faith and learning operate in isolation, each within their own sphere. On the side of faith, we carry out chapel periods, Bible classes, co-curricular activities such as a week of prayer, and we encourage students to become involved in weekend worship activities. This is good. The problem is that learning takes place in a different realm. If one were to drop in on a history science or language lesson, or technology or physical education class, it would be difficult to see any difference between what is being taught there and what is taught in any good but non-Christian school. There is no 
meaningful connection between faith and the subject matter. There is no link between the topic and our lives as spiritual beings. Even if there is a devotional thought at the beginning of the class period, it is often disconnected from what the students are studying. The result of this disconnect between faith and learning is disintegration. With little reasonable evidence to consider, faith erodes into blind belief. And without a faith perspective relating knowledge to the source of truth, learning begins to fragment. A second situation is remote interaction and interchange between faith and learning. Frequently, however, this takes the form of an assault, wherein faith shouts across the chasm, launching a vitriolic attack on the heresies of evolution, postmodernism, contemporary music, hypnotism, etc. While this is perhaps slightly better than total isolation, it falls short of true integration. A third approach occurs when we begin to explore the overlap, the obvious interface between faith and learning. For example, we present the creation perspective when dealing with the origins of life. We include an analysis of theocracy when examining forms of government. We mention pertinent Bible prophecies when discussing various world empires. We note the biblical position on human sexuality when studying STIs. This is clearly closer to what we want our students to experience. The problem, though, is that there are vast expanses of learning still disassociated from faith. The result is that students begin to create these false dichotomies in their lives, where a certain slice of life is dedicated to God. But the remainder, great swaths of their lives, are lived without reference to God and to His plan. What we are seeking is a unified Christian perspective, an authentic integration of faith and learning. This takes place when faith and learning meet and merge. This means that whenever learning takes place, faith is exercised in an endeavor to see the fullness of life from God's perspective. And faith itself implies a commitment to grow in a knowledge of the truth. What we want to attain and what we want our students to experience is a progression. From isolation, a complete disjunction between faith and learning, to the beginnings of interaction, even if at times this is but a fiery exchange, to the development of an interface between faith and learning, an exploration of prominent overlaps to ultimately authentic faith integration, a unified perspective built upon a biblical worldview. Let's suppose that I present a riddle. There is something that we all have, something essential for normal living, something that we utilize every time we make an important decision and something that strangely most of us are unaware that we even possess. What is it? The answer, of course, is a worldview. What is a worldview? It is the global concept that we have of life and of the universe around us, whereby 
we establish priorities and make decisions. It unifies thought, orients action, and defines the meaning of life. A worldview incorporates at least three characteristics. It is pre-philosophic. That is, it is a conceptual framework that includes our basic assumptions and convictions. Our control beliefs, to which many times we have given little thought. Second, a worldview is normative. That is, it suggests behavioral norms, implies our priorities, and structures our values. Third, a worldview is often expressed through a story, a basic mythos regarding origin, purpose, and destiny. Some of these grand narratives include the secular explanation of human origins via evolutionary theory, the Enlightenment view that rational thought linked to scientific and technological process will lead to social advance, the Marxist account of social emancipation driven by the revolution of the proletariat, and the Christian perspective on the great controversy between good and evil. One way to view the biblical worldview, for example, is in terms of that meta-narrative, comprised of at least four extraordinary events, creation, the fall, redemption at Calvary, and ultimate restoration and recreation at the second coming of Christ. Each of these defining moments, these turning points, may be represented with a fundamental question and various associated elements. For creation, what is God's intention? This points to the elements of divine purpose, the image of God, relationships, and peace and rest. In terms of the fall, how has God's purpose been distorted? Which takes us to components such as the sin problem, the cosmic conflict, biblical values, and character formation. Redemption leads to the question, how does God help us to respond? With its associated constructs, the plan of salvation, the gospel commission, the Holy Spirit, and grace and forgiveness. Finally, recreation, and the question, how can we be restored in the image of God? It highlights the second coming, eternal life, health and healing, as well as whole person development. Together, the grand narrative of the biblical worldview. There are, of course, other ways to consider a worldview. One focus has to do with our perspective of God. We can view God, for example, as either personal or impersonal, involved or detached. We can also view God as finite or infinite, limited or without limits. When we intersect these positions, we end up with quadrants, four basic perspectives of God. Paganism, for instance, takes the position that the gods are both personal and finite. Animists, for example, see the gods as closely involved with the lives of human beings, but at the same time they are also finite. If a woman gives birth to a beautiful child, she may name the child ugly. 
so that the gods will hear her calling the child and not come and snatch the child away. Clearly, if a god can be duped simply by a name, that is a god with significant limitations. In deism, God is the great clockmaker. He assembles the clock, he winds it up, and then he leaves it to run while he attends other important matters in the universe. Clearly, a God who does not maintain a personal relationship with what he has created. Also, a finite God, one who cannot attend to all matters together. In pantheism, God is often equated as the force of nature, a divine energy in all. But as the force, the God of pantheism is also impersonal. The Christian perspective of God is theism. God is both personal, interested in even the smallest details of our lives and infinite, all-powerful, omniscient, and omnipresent. And the way we view God makes a difference in the way we live our lives. Faith integration approaches the discipline and its corresponding subject matter at the deepest level, that of the worldview. It connects the discipline to its biblical foundation. It seeks to understand content through the lens of faith. What does it mean to approach life and learning from a biblical worldview? At least five formative actions are involved. First, we make scripture relevant. This action affirms the pertinence of God's word. It is based on the intersection of two concepts. A, the word of God speaks with relevance to each dimension of life. And B, every discipline should connect with our lives in meaningful ways. Consequently, God's word should be significant to each academic discipline. This leads us to seek for a thoughtful understanding of Scripture in relation not only to life, but also to learning. Second, we accept that all truth is God's truth. This principle is anchored in Scripture. James writes, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. Similarly, the book of Proverbs declares, The Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. And John states simply, Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. When we hold that all truth is ultimately God's truth, we will intentionally seek to connect all knowledge back to its source. Third, we assess and clarify assumptions. Every discipline involves underlying assumptions. These include the nature of the discipline and how it should be conducted, the origin, meaning, and purpose of life, the nature of truth and reality, and our relationship with God, with other human beings, and to the world around us. Our task is to evaluate how these assumptions align with the biblical paradigm. Fourth, 
we trace the great controversy theme. Every dimension of life is affected by the conflict between good and evil. The great controversy theme is, in fact, the sense-making narrative for life. Here, we endeavor to understand how our discipline is shaped by this cosmic conflict. And fifth, we consider the Gospel Commission. Here we view our profession as ministry. We seek to live a life of service, a life with an outward focus. We see witness not so much as an event, something we do, but as a lifestyle, someone we are. After all, God declares, you are my witnesses. Through these five formative constructs, make scripture foundational, affirm that all truth is God's truth, assess and clarify assumptions, trace the great controversy theme, and consider the Gospel Commission. Through these, we assemble the biblical worldview. What can we do as educators to make the biblical worldview real? What can we do to connect learning to the biblical perspective? There are four tangible ways to express the biblical worldview throughout the teaching learning experience. Through paradigm, through themes, through issues, and through integrative questions. First, let us consider paradigm. The biblical worldview brings a distinctive paradigm to each discipline. The contours of this paradigm, in turn, affect our beliefs and influence our priorities as we interact with a discipline and its applications. Here are some examples. A biblical paradigm for the arts sees God as the author of beauty and creativity. It maintains that we must assess both the medium and the message, referencing divine values, and the consideration must be given to both the purpose and the effect of a work of art, whether self-serving or God-directed. It examines the relationship between Christianity and cultural expression, exploring matters of the spiritual and the secular, of the sacred and the common. A biblical paradigm for language and literature views God as the master communicator, expressing ideas through oral, written, and visual modalities. It maintains that humanity was created in the image of God with the gift of expressive communication. While sin distorts language and communication as evident at the Tower of Babel, God seeks to restore language and bridge that communication gap, as he did on the day of Pentecost and with an ultimate reunification when the universe is restored and all nations, tongues, and people with one voice glorify God. Ultimately, language in its noblest form involves communication with and about God. In a biblical paradigm, the elegance, beauty, and coherence of mathematics is a witness to God, the master mathematician. Numerical and geometric patterns in nature are evidence of God's design in the deep structure of the universe. The paradigm 
also includes the application of mathematics to alleviate real problems in a fallen world. And the identification of spiritual concepts illustrated through mathematical relationships and processes. A biblical paradigm for the sciences holds that God is the designer, creator, and sustainer. While we find evidence in the physical world of sin distortion, there is a divine plan for restoration. Anytime there is healing, this runs counter to the second law of thermodynamics. Meanwhile, human beings are to engage in a responsible stewardship of the environment and its ecosystems. The paradigm also acknowledges the reliance of scientific process and prediction on underlying order and examines the role of research, reason, and faith in the acquisition of knowledge. Overall, the paradigm that a Christian worldview brings to an area of knowledge is Christ-centered, Bible-based, life-connected, and kingdom-directed. What biblical paradigm concept could I highlight in a subject that I teach? How would I go about building that concept into the course? The biblical paradigm informs themes and issues inherent within the discipline. Themes are broad ideas that reappear multiple times throughout a course or program of studies. These concepts may be identified by examining course goals and objectives, unit titles, and lists of key terms. Christ highlighted the importance of themes when he critiqued the Pharisees and the teachers of the law for focusing on minutia while ignoring the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. While every discipline incorporates multiple themes, here are a few examples. In art, themes of beauty, creativity, emotion, and talent. In business courses, themes of accountability, of control, stewardship, and success. In geography or social studies, themes of culture, globalization, poverty, and tradition. In history courses, conflict, liberty, heritage, and peace. In language, heroes, plot, and stereotype. Themes in mathematics include assumption, infinity, proof, and transformation. In physical education, fitness, fairness, teamwork, and winning and losing. Themes in psychology, behavior, development, motives, relationships, and self-worth. In religion courses, themes of community, faith, forgiveness, law, and grace. In science, cause and effect, design, symbiosis, and truth. And in technology, themes of confidentiality, privacy, and security. From the faith perspective, a key purpose of themes is to help the student understand the relationship of the theme with the character of God and his plan for humankind and for the universe. To enable the student to view the theme and the light of the great controversy between good and evil and of the gospel commission. And to discover spiritual insights 
and foster Christian attitudes and convictions. What would be an important theme in one of the subjects that I teach? How could I connect this theme to the spiritual life of my students? Real life issues with ethical implications exist in every discipline and in every subject area. Some of these issues are cross-disciplinary, such as the right to privacy in business, psychology, technology, and research. Vegetarianism in science, health, geography, philosophy, and religion. And plagiarism in the arts, business, literature, and technology. Other issues may be more discipline-specific. Issues in the arts include the acceptance or the rejection of culture, the lifestyle of the artist, nudity and violence, among others. Business issues include equitable taxation, fair profit, monopolization, sexual harassment, unionization and strikes, and deception in advertising. Geography issues could include immigration policies, squatter settlements, foreign aid and national debt, exploitation of natural resources, and waste disposal. Justification for war, spying, sabotage, and the utilization of chemical, biological, or nuclear weapons are issues that can be examined in history classes. The areas of language and literature present a variety of issues, such as freedom of speech, pornography and eroticism, defamation, stereotypes, and sensationalism. In physical education, contentious issues include competition, deception, hormone enhancement, sponsorship, and contract fulfillment. In psychology, there are issues of hypnosis, IQ testing, sexual expression, codependency, confidentiality, and informed consent. Global warming, cloning, animal rights, euthanasia, nuclear energy, and waste recycling are some of the controversial issues in science. And issues in technology include piracy, hacking, virus creation, netiquette, respect for privacy, and intellectual property. Through an examination of issues, we want to promote ethical, moral reasoning. When considering a controversial issue, we ask, what are the purposes God intended for this area of human activity? And what biblical response is called for? Throughout, we seek to identify guiding principles and moral values with the intent to teach my people the difference between the holy and the common, to show them how to distinguish between the unclean and the clean. Perhaps this is why Ellen White wrote, Character building is the most important work ever entrusted to human beings, and never before was its diligent study so important as now. Education, page 225. What could be a critical issue in one of the subjects that I teach? How might I address this issue to contribute to the moral development of students. The biblical paradigm informs themes and issues inherent within the discipline. We can then engage students by asking thought-provoking, integrative questions. First, we should create spaces 
to explore the great questions of life. Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? How do I know what is right? What is wrong around and within me? What is the solution? We can also utilize integrative questions that connect closely with the discipline. For example, in mathematics, when studying the topic of coefficients, we might pose the question, to what would you compare the positive and negative coefficients in your life? We might then ask students to write down an example or two of how positive influences have improved their spiritual life, or how negative influences could reduce the quality of their life. On the topic of the number line, we might note that there are an infinite number of points between zero and one, yet each of them can be represented by a real number. Then we could ask students to reflect on the questions. Who am I to God, to others, to myself? When studying about transformation in mathematics, we can ponder the fact that Jesus is the great transformer and consider what might need to be transformed in my life. Or when discussing symbols, simply the question, what do I stand for? In biology, an integrative question might be, to what extent, if any, should genetic engineering be used to enhance human well-being? In an English course, what are the similarities and differences in interpreting a biblical text and interpreting other literature texts? In sociology, to what extent are social problems caused by inadequacies in societal structures or by individual or group irresponsibility? In a business course, students could consider what social responsibility, if any, does a business enterprise have toward its employees and the community in which the business is located? In criminal justice, to what extent should the penal system be retributive or restorative or both? In political sciences, students can ponder the question, what is the role of forgiveness in international relations? In a history class, students can discuss the questions, how do views on the direction of history, such as linear, cyclical or teleological, fit or not fit with the Christian narrative. In economics, what is the relationship between the quest for profitability and the Christian call for compassion and justice? In a sports training course, what are the limits, if any, on allowable means for enhancing athletic performance? Within a physics class, we might pose the question, what are the similarities and differences between the use of models in scientific inquiry and the use of models in theological inquiry? In a communications course, what is the potential for finding common ground through dialogue when the conversationalists are embedded in different traditions? And in the fine arts, what are the limits, if any, on freedom for creative expression? Throughout, we want our students to think deeply and Christianly. This can happen through small group discussions, through reflective essays, and by having students keep a journal to record personal reflections and spiritual insights that they have gained. What could be an integrative question in one of the subjects that I teach? How might I use this question to help my students think deeply and Christianly? 
We began by noting that faith integration takes place when faith and learning blend within the context of a Christian life. We also affirmed that faith integration is biblical. We then discussed various approaches to faith integration. Isolation, a disjunction between faith and learning. Initial interaction, which often, unfortunately, takes the form of a fiery exchange. Interphase, where we begin to candidly explore obvious overlaps. And true integration, where we examine the discipline from a unified Christian perspective, a biblical worldview. We then set out to delineate key features of the biblical worldview. One way was by understanding the key turning points in cosmic history, creation, the fall, redemption, and restoration, and the implications that these have for our life. Next, we examined five formative constructs that connect faith and learning through our worldview. These included making scripture foundational, affirming all truth as God's truth, assessing and clarifying our assumptions and those within the discipline, tracing the great controversy theme in the courses we teach, and considering the implications of the Gospel Commission. All of this with the intent to assist students in assembling a biblical worldview. To make the biblical worldview real, however, we must find tangible ways of expressing that worldview. Some ways that can be effective include examining paradigms, exploring themes and issues, and posing integrative questions. In essence, faith integration takes place when we embed the biblical worldview within our courses, within each discipline. Only then will we as Christian educators fulfill the ultimate purpose of faith integration. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. Only then will our students experience shalom. All your children shall be taught by God, and great will be the peace of your children. Faith integration through the biblical worldview makes a difference.